walking through the book of Ephesians verse by verse, and our verse today is one verse, verse number 18 in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 18. So if you have your copy of God's Word, would you find your place there in Ephesians chapter 5, 18? If not, it'll be on the screen here momentarily. Dwight L. Moody was a shoe salesman in Chicago in the mid-19th century. And he, he, he met the Lord Jesus. He fell in love with Jesus. He started pointing people to Jesus wherever he went and whomever he met. He was never ordained. He never had any formal training. Yet God used him to reach thousands for Christ as an evangelist. There was a group of British pastors. They were planning an evangelistic rally, like an evangelistic crusade. And the name D.L. Moody came up as a possible preacher slash evangelist. Well, one of those British pastors said very cynically and with a lot of skepticism, he said, why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's inexperienced. He's uneducated. He's unordained. Who does he think he is? Then he said this. Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? One of the other wiser pastors spoke up. He had heard D.L. Moody preach and he responded. He said, no, Mr. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. That is Ephesians 5, verse 18. That's it. Let's pray and go home. Or go to life group. No, just kidding. That's it, man. That's what it... Be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. Here's what the Word of God says. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you teach us today from your Word, what does it mean, what does does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? Help us to understand, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, so I want to speak to you on the subject, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? According to this verse, it is the will of the Lord, because if you look back in verse 17, it's pretty clear. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? For you not to be drunk with wine, but for you to be filled with the Spirit. Do you know it's the will of the Lord for you not to be drunk? How many of you know that? Don't be drunk, right? Now I know the topic of drinking is, drinking itself is very popular in our world today. I know drinking is very popular in the church today. I know some of you, maybe many of you, drink alcohol. I personally don't. That doesn't mean I never have. I have in the past, and when I, not because of the taste. When I tasted alcohol in my past, it tasted like it didn't want to be wet. Just, uh. But drinking, I know that's a popular topic today. I understand that. And basically, we have these two temptations that we can fall under. And one of them is, on this side, we say, hey, look. That person drinks. He or she must not be very spiritually mature they must lack some spirituality and we judge them right and I'm talking about in the context of the church and then on the other side the temptation is we look at somebody and say oh they abstain from alcohol he or she must be uh, legalistic in their faith they must be old-fashioned in tradition and think they're holier than thou so both sides are judging right (laughs) so it's important for us to understand okay here's what the Bible has to say about alcohol. What does the Bible have to say? Well, it's clear the Bible does not say it is a sin to drink wine or it is a sin to drink even strong drink. And strong drink translates, interestingly enough, into beer. And it's not a sin, of course, to drink alcohol. That is not, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible clearly teaches that drunkenness is sin. Drunkenness is sin. My friend Robbie Gallaty has preached a message called, Is it wise for a Christian to drink alcohol? So wherever you fall on that spectrum, I'd encourage you to go listen to that message. 
It's done extremely well. He's a pastor at Long Hollow in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and you can hear that message. I'd encourage that. The reason I bring this up, because it's in our text today, and I want to ask the question as we get started, why has Paul put these two together? Why has he put, and do not be drunk with wine, alongside, be filled with the Spirit? Why are these two in the same verse together? Is it for comparison? Uh, well, you, if you've studied the book of Acts, you know this is not the first time we've run into these two relating to one another. On the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, here's what happened on the day of Pentecost, verse 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all, they were all together in one place. The disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were staying. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and they were amazed. The Bible says they were astonished, saying, Are not all these who were speaking Galileans? And how is it? that we hear each one of us in his own native language. In other words, how are these uneducated Galileans speaking all of our different languages? They don't know any languages. How is this happening? And of course they were given utterance by the Holy Spirit. But there was another group mocking and said, listen to this, they are filled with new wine. So some thought they were drunk. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there, Paul, not Paul, but Luke uses that there as contrast. Contrasting the two. Here in Ephesians 5, we might think Paul's using it for comparison. In other words, don't be under the influence of wine. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But that's where the comparison stops. Because all along, from chapter 2 on, Paul has been contrasting. Hasn't he? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. But now you're alive in Christ. That's a contrast. He uses the contrast of put off the old self, put on the new self. He uses the contrast of put away falsehood in chapter 4. Speak truth. Chapter 5, walk in love, not in lust. Walk, as, walk not as unwise, but as wise. Contrast. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Contrast. And be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the, with the Spirit. Contrast. So he's contrasting here. And he's contrasting for us to understand that we as believers should no longer live to satisfy the desires of the flesh. Because look, drunkenness in Ephesus was a problem. It was a problem among the unbelievers who would worship. There was a cult in Ephesus at the time called Dionysus. And part of their worship experience was to get drunk. In fact, their symbol for their, their cult was a vine where they got wine. That was their symbol. And Paul's saying, that's no longer okay for you who are in Christ. You're no longer to live that way. You're no longer to be drunk on the flesh. You're to be filled with the Spirit. And let's be honest. In the flesh, we all have something that we get drunk on. It may not be alcohol for you. It may be anger. Some of you are over the limit with your anger. right? You are drunk on anger. Or maybe you're drunk on a critical spirit. Or maybe you're drunk on lust. Or maybe yours is materialism. Or maybe yours is fear. Maybe yours is gossip or greed. Maybe it's self-righteousness. Maybe it's pride for you. Maybe you're drunk on racism. Whatever that is that you're drunk, there's too many to name. So Paul says, no longer are we to live that way. In Christ, we are not to be drunk on the flesh. We're to be filled with the Spirit. So for Paul, what he is presenting here, it's an issue of control. What is controlling you? What are you controlled by? Are you controlled by how you feel? Your circumstances? Are you controlled by your flesh? 
Are you under the control of the Spirit? And so our takeaway today, based on Ephesians 5.18, don't hijack control from the Holy Spirit. Don't hijack control from the Holy Spirit. Don't be like so many believers and hijack control and say, you know what, I'll just do the best I can do. The best you can do will never cut it. Never. That's why we're told here to be filled with the Spirit. So I want to focus on that verb for the rest of our time together, being filled. I want to break down this verb. So if we look at verse number 18... In Ephesians 5, it says, Do not be drunk or do not get drunk with wine. That is debauchery. But be what, church? Be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to really focus on this word, this verb, and break it down. Be filled. So the first aspect of being filled that I want to speak to you about is being filled is commanded. It is not suggested. This verb is in what we call the imperative mood. This be filled in the scripture is in the imperative mood. That means it is a command. We are commanded to be filled. And so why is it commanded? Well, the Lord knew that you and I would have days, weeks, months where we would be tempted to be controlled by our circumstance, how we feel, our flesh. He knew that. So he has commanded us. He knew there would be months like January. The J in the word joy does not stand for January. January is the month where you're broke, you're cold, and your pants are too tight, right? January is rough, and it lasts such a long time. God knew that. He knew there'd be days like this and weeks like this. And like Matt said, man, we don't know what's going to happen this week. What in the world? We may get no inches of snow. We may get 10 inches. Who knows what's coming? That's how life is, and God knows that. So He's commanded us from the get-go, hey, be filled with the Spirit. And, and don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Now, this word drunk, this is an interesting word. I like the way it means to be intoxicated, of course, enumerated, under the control of, under the influence of. But Homer describes it in a very interesting way, this word in the Greek. He, he talks about a bull's hide that is stretched, and to make it elastic, it was soaked in fat soaked. So the word soaked is the same word in the Greek as, as drunk. So don't be soaked with wine. Don't sit so sour and stink with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be soaked with wine. I can recall when Tanya was pregnant with Brady. We were living in Louisiana at the time. Tanya delivered Brady at St. Tammany Hospital. You can hear the Catholicism in the name of that hospital. Catholicism was pretty prevalent there in southeast Louisiana. And her doctor, her delivery doctor, was Catholic. And he told Tanya we had scheduled for her to go in to induce labor. And he told Tanya, before you come in, drink a glass of wine. He knew I was a Baptist pastor. So he looked at me. He said, do you understand what that is? <clears throat> and I looked at him kind of funny. And then he told a story. He says, I had another Baptist pastor whose wife we scheduled to induce. And I gave them the same instruction. Drink a glass of wine. When that pastor and his wife came to the hospital, she was hammered, D-U-R-N-K, drunk, could not stand up, could not sit up straight, could not speak a sentence. She was hammered, and the doctor said, what happened? 
And he said, we did exactly what you told us to do. She drank a glass of wine. And upon further investigation, the doctor figured out that she drank a whole glass bottle of wine, not just one glass. She drank the whole glass bottle because that's what they thought that he meant. And so he looked at me, do you understand what a glass of wine is? I said, yeah, you don't know my past, do you? <laughs> And so Danya neither had neither of those, but the whole idea here is we are commanded, do not be soaked with wine, that is debauchery, that is a depraved lifestyle, but be filled with the Spirit. This again, this verb is found in the imperative mood, so we are commanded. Well, why are we commanded to be filled? What is the difference between being filled with the Spirit? What is the difference between that and being sealed with the Spirit, being indwelt with the Spirit, being baptized by the Spirit? Is there a difference? And if so, what is the difference? Well, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, we are told that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if in fact the Spirit of God indwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. The moment you are regenerated, the moment you are born again, the moment you are converted, the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. He takes up residence in your heart and life. Uh, in this very book, in Ephesians 1, Paul says, In Him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were what? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That happens upon conversion. Later Paul says there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. In 1 Corinthians Paul says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So we are told again, don't be drunk with wine. My personal position is that I abstain from it totally. But even if you do not abstain, do not be drunk, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. This is a command. It is not a suggestion. The indwelling of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit, the baptism, those happen one time. But this whole idea of being filled with the Spirit is something that happens throughout a believer's life. It is the process of what we call sanctification. So the question is, not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have? You don't get more of the Holy Spirit at some second or third baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is not doctrinally correct at all. You get all of Him upon salvation. So the question is, how much of you does he have, not how much of him do you have? But how much of your life is under the control of the Holy Spirit? Only you can answer that. I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that question. I think about Peter. Before he was filled with the Spirit, he was cowardly. Then he was filled and he boldly preached and 3,000 came to faith in Christ. I think about Paul said he was filled with the Spirit. Then he went into the synagogue and he preached Jesus is the Son of God. That same power indwells you, believer. Be filled with the Spirit. So try to figure out, okay, what area of my life is not under the control of the Holy Spirit? Where are those areas? We are commanded it is not suggested. Here's a second aspect of this verb, be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. It's not only commanded, it is repeatable, it's not sustainable. You can't be filled one time for the rest of your life and that's it. It's not sustainable, it is repeatable. It's something that we need to put on repeat to be filled with the Spirit. I think about parenting. You don't parent one time, right? I mean, what is parenting? Let's just, let's just be honest. Parenting is 80% repeating yourself, right? And then 20%, well, repeating yourself. 
It's just what you do. Right? In the same way, being filled with the Spirit is something that's on repeat. We do it constantly, moment by moment. The, the literal translation is being constant. Be being filled. Be constantly being filled. So the, the, what we're talking about here is the tense of the verb. The tense of the verb being filled, it is repeatable. It is in the present tense. It is ongoing. You keep on being filled. It's present, not past. You were sealed in the past in Christ, yes. You were indwelt in the past, in, yes. But you're filled continually, right? Constantly, repeatedly. You're filled with the Spirit. It's not something that happens one time. According to the book of Acts in the early church, this is how they operated. They were filled in Acts 2. Again, they're filled again in Acts 4. They're filled again and again and again. You say, why must I continually be filled with the Spirit? One word is sin. Somebody say sin. You sin constantly, so you must be filled with the Spirit constantly. Every time you sin, you quench the Holy Spirit. So you must repent of that and repeatedly be filled with the Holy Spirit. We also need to be filled with the Holy Spirit continually because a new circumstance may come up that we figure out, hey, I don't have this under the control of the Holy Spirit. I don't have this area of my life is operated by the flesh and not the Spirit. And I need to bring that under the control of the Holy Spirit. What are those areas in your life? What emotions are not under the control of the Holy Spirit? What thoughts do you not have under the control of what actions, what decisions that you make are not under the control of the Holy Spirit? What ambitions and goals and dreams are not under the control of the Holy Spirit? What is that? See, we, we have to repeat this. This is part of following Christ as we constantly, repeatedly are being filled with His Spirit. We don't read the Bible one time and we're done. I had a lady in a former church tell me, I've already read the Bible. I don't need to read it again. What? You stay in the Word. You continually pray without ceasing. Pray at all times in the Spirit. You talk about the Lord. You have conversations about them. Everything you listen to, everything you engage in, is it producing in you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? If not, you need to stop it. This is why we cannot stop teaching biblical truth. We can't. We cannot stop teaching biblical truth about the Bible. We cannot stop teaching biblical truth about abortion and adoption. We cannot stop teaching biblical truth about creation and evolution and man and sin and God and homosexuality. And, and gender and the sexual revolution. We cannot stop teaching biblical truth about truth, about love, about mercy, about grace, about forgiveness. You know why we can't stop teaching the truth biblically about these issues? Because the world won't stop talking about them. And when you have a situation where the world is screaming about something and the church is silent on that same something, then you've got one worldview out there and you lose a whole generation. In church, we've lost too many generations. We've lost too many. So we must put it on repeat and continually teach the truth. That's what happened in Acts 4. Acts 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to this. They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Some began to, some continued to. Speak the Word of God with boldness. We cannot stop teaching biblical truth. We can't. Don't hijack control from the Holy Spirit. But we are to, number one, what are we to do? We are to be filled with the Spirit. It is commanded. It is repeatable. 
Here's the third aspect, be filled. We've looked at the mood of it, it's imperative. We've looked at the tense of it, it's present. Now we're going to look at the form of the verb. It is in the plural form. Somebody say plural. Not singular, plural. (laughs) Meaning what? Being filled is inclusive, not exclusive. It is the responsibility of every follower of Jesus to be filled with the Spirit. It includes everybody in Christ. Not just the holy man of God. It includes all of us who are in Christ. You know how when you make spaghetti for dinner and you only have enough spaghetti for 175 people? Well, the Holy Spirit is only enough for every single person who is in Christ. In that sense, being filled is inclusive, not exclusive. There's not just a certain group of people who can be filled with the Spirit. It's not some superhero higher than degree of life. This is the normal way of life. For a believer to not live in the flesh, that's abnormal. But to be filled with the Spirit, that's normal. It's, it's inclusive. Being filled, it's in, the, it's in this plural form. To be filled is the responsibility of all of us. Every Christian businessman and businesswoman, every Christian husband and wife, every Christian teenager, every Christian child, every Christian employer and employee, Every Christian doctor, lawyer, teacher, down the line, stay-at-home mom or dad, every single solitary Christian, it is your responsibility to be filled with the Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit who empowered David to defeat Goliath, He indwells you. The same Holy Spirit who, who empowered Moses to lead God's people out of Egypt, He empowers you. He indwells you. The same Holy Spirit that gave Paul the ability to write, what, a third of the New Testament? He indwells you. So moment by moment, day by day, be filled with the Spirit. Husbands, if you're going to love your wife as Christ loved the church, I'm telling you, you can't do that in the flesh. That ain't happening in the flesh. you got to be filled with the Spirit. Wives, if you're going to submit to your husbands as to the Lord, that's not happening in the flesh. That only comes by way of the Spirit. And for you to live your life according to the gospel, that is not going to happen in the flesh. That only comes by Spirit-filled life. Now next week, we'll look and see what that looks like as Paul goes in deeper from 19 to 21 and tells us, okay, this is the Spirit-filled life. But God desires for you to live the Spirit-filled life. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. That you're to live by being filled with the Spirit every day. Not just on Sundays. If you're here today, you've had a rough week. I get it. Listen, it was rough. You came in here on empty. You really didn't want to come today. You're on empty. You've heard a lyric of a song. You've heard a a prayer, maybe a scripture. You may hear something in life group that encourages you and, and fills you with the Spirit. right? And if that happens, praise God, I'm glad that happened. But if that is the pattern of your life, if you live Monday through Saturday empty of the Spirit and come on Sunday and get filled with the Spirit and on Monday you're empty of the Spirit, that is not what God has for you. That is not the abundant life He has for you. That is not the Spirit-filled life He has for you. It's not. So in the morning, when you put your earbuds in in the gym or you're in your car, you put your earbuds in, don't listen to that podcast. Don't listen to that content. Don't listen to that music that is not fostering in you, filling you with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If you, get, if you finish with a podcast, if you finish with a song, if you finish a conversation and you walk away and you're angry or you're frustrated and you're not producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, if you're not displaying that, 
then you need, you need to cut that stuff off. You need to quit listening to that. There is no cultural moment that should cause any of us to abandon being Christ-like. Nothing. Be filled with the Spirit. It's inclusive. It's for every believer. Don't hijack control from the Holy Spirit. Here's the last one, number four, being filled. This word is, is commanded. That means it is in the imperative mood. It is repeatable. That means it's in the present tense. It is inclusive. means it's in the plural form. It, it includes all of us. And number four, the voice of this verb is in the passive voice, not the active voice, which means being filled is passive, not active. Meaning the subject of being filled is having the action done to them. They're not doing the action. Passive, not active. Passive voice is, the idea is you be filled with the Spirit. However, that's not something that you do on your own. That's something that happens to you. Like, for example, when you say, I did my research. And what you mean is, I listen to somebody's half-baked YouTube video. Or I watch somebody's half-baked YouTube video. You really didn't do a whole lot. You just listened to what they already did. Right? Uh, the Spirit of God, the, the work of being filled with the Spirit is not a work of man in that we are active and we're the ones doing it. It, it is the work of God, right? You don't get slain in the Spirit and then you're filled with the Spirit. It's, it's, it doesn't operate like that. You don't have some holy man of God lay his hands on you and pray and you're filled with his Spirit. This is a work of God. It is not a work of man. We don't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. We desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We trust that Jesus is the one who whose truth fills us with that Holy Spirit. We desire that, and then we're filled with the Spirit. Well, how do, I, how do I prepare myself? What can I do? What do I participate in in being filled with the Spirit? Well, you get in the Word. You pray. You, you, you engage in a relationship with the Lord Jesus on a daily basis. You walk with Him. You talk with Him. You meditate on His Word. You, you have conversation with Him in prayer. You connect with other believers. And y'all have conversation about what God's doing in your life and how you can pray for each other and hold each other accountable. You hear the word. You ask in prayer. You tell the lost. And notice who is the one doing the work here. Be filled as passive, not active. And we can look at verse 18 again. Be not drunk with wine, or do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the what? The who? There you go. He's a who. He's not a what. He's not an it. He's not a force. He's not a magical show. He's a person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. He is the one who fills us. He's the agent that fills us. He's the comforter. He comforts us. Not so we can be comfortable, but so we can be comforters to others. He helps us. He's the helper. See, the potential we have here in verse 18, it's staggering. That we don't have to be drunk in this flesh on whatever that is for you. Because <laughs> the focus, the main point here is be filled with the Spirit. The potential is, should astonish us. So this year, as you walk through January <laughs> of 2024 into 2024, remember this. When you're exhausted... The Holy Spirit is not. And when you're frustrated, the Holy Spirit is not. And when you're weak, the Holy Spirit is not. And when you're angry, the Holy Spirit is not. And when you're unfaithful, the Holy Spirit is not. Why would you not want to be filled daily with the Holy Spirit? Do not hijack control from the Holy Spirit. But ask Him to fill you. Ask Him today, Lord, what part of my life is not under your control? Where is it? He has commanded this. It is repeatable. It is inclusive. And it is passive. And you ask Him to do the work in your life, believer. I want to invite you to stand. Got a couple of... A couple of challenges for us in this invitation. First of all, if you're not a believer, if you've never trusted Christ, you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit until you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Until you're 
indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't happen until you turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus, asking Him to come into your life. He's done everything for that to happen. The Holy Spirit is here today and that drawing that you're feeling, the Bible says, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That drawing is the work of the Holy Spirit. He has revealed to you that Jesus is right and you're wrong. That your sin has separated you from God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and Jesus has come and laid down his life so you can have eternity with him forever and you can have an abundant life with him now a spirit filled life one of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self control you can have that life but you've got to surrender to Christ and if you've done that And the question for you and me, for those that have done that, is, hey, what area of my life is still not under the control of the Holy Spirit? Or which area have I allowed to slip back into the flesh? Because we all have that, right? So let the Holy Spirit deal with that in your heart today. If you're interested in coming, let us know, hey, I've trusted Christ, but I've not been baptized. We'd love to receive you today. Or, Or maybe you'd say, man, I'm ready to join the church. We'd love to receive you today for that. Or... Hey, I I need to surrender to this call of ministry. And I don't know what that looks like, but man, God's really calling me to some vocational ministry. Come let us know. We'd love to talk to you about that. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to worship and you respond to the gospel today as the Lord leads you. Father, thank you for Ephesians 5.18. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for drawing us unto salvation, for indwelling us, for sealing us, for baptizing us, for filling us. Lord, let us spend 2024 not in our feelings, but let us spend it in the filling of the Holy Spirit. God, would you have your way among these men and women, boys and girls, as they respond to your gospel? In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, let's worship, church.